So welcome to the latest video on Back of the Net where we've been speaking to a, a series of names and faces that have been associated with AFC Bournemouth throughout the years and today's guest I am sure you'll recognise it is former chairman of the club and supporter for many years is Trevor Watkins. Trevor. How Hi. Are you? Yeah good, good evening. Nice to see you. <laughs> good, good and I'm liking the mug as well. Nice and this, is, this, is, this is my Christmas present from my daughters. This was, uh, it was very, very apt actually. Absolutely superb. And uh, Jeff, you're wearing uh, a classic shirt as well. I feel a bit left yeah. out. Oh, it should have been yeah, this, this is this is the shirt purchased on, uh, I think I purchased it on Wembley Way as we were walking up to Wembley the day we played Grimsby. Um, yeah. Won't talk about the result, but it was a fantastic day. Yeah, oh, wasn't it just? Well, I'm sure we'll touch on that in this video. But uh, Trevor, um, I know you grew up in the area, started supporting AC Bournemouth in the 70s. Um and then alongside this, outside of football, in terms of your career, um, you soon established yourself in this sort of legal profession. You worked in the city as a lawyer, um, whilst mm -hmm. constantly supporting the Cherries throughout uh, the 70s and then 80s, which included, you know, the cup upsets and I'm thinking oh, yeah, of Harry Redknapp, at the time. Mm. Dave Webb. Yeah. And then and then in the 90s, which saw some turbulent times, let's say. Um, and it was it was in December 96, I think, when the chairman at the time quit. Was it Ken Gardner at the time? It was Ken was there, Norman Hayward was there. Yeah. And it was all quite a bum fight, wasn't it? And they all resigned yeah. and they were all falling out with each other. And yeah. I think yeah, we owed a few million quid. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's nothing like mm. modern days. So can you um, explain how, how you turned from the average man on the terrace to someone that ultimately threw themselves headfirst in this you know financial nightmare that the cherries were in? Well, I was... I probably was never really cut out to be a lawyer. I wasn't. I was going to be an English teacher, and then for one reason or another, I was at Bournemouth School, and I ended up um, doing an extra year to, to try and go and do law at university, which I ended up doing. And to be honest, I was working in the city, but my dad had taken me to watch the Cherries February '74. I think we played Warsaw, which I think we won one nil, and I just carried on going. And went with my mates and from school. We used to play football, not very well, but used to love it. And it really became part of life. So my dad and I used to keep on going. And by the time we got to 97, we were sitting in the main stand. We used to stand on the away end because it's what we could afford at the time. But yeah, working in the city, my goodness, I could afford a season ticket in the centre of the stand. <laughs> so um, high times sitting in that old wooden <laughs> stand before it was falling down and condemned. Um, Terry, Terry Lovell, the commercial director at the time. And, you know, as a vice president, we used to get a cup of tea and biscuits at half time in the uh, very luxurious under the stand um, sort of director's lounge area. And I just said to him, you know, by the way, I work in the city. I'm a lifetime supporter. If I can do anything to help, I'd love to. He said, oh, right, right. Well, I'll think about it. Let me I'll let you know. And then. The news in the Daily Echo, because of those times, we rely right on that every day in print form to see what was going on, unless you're doing teletext and, and, and ringing the, the ringing a premium number to see what was going oh, on. Yeah. Um, and he hadn't rung me, and yet the news was getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, I think it was the Rotherham game, Matty Holland had been playing in, that I'd made this offer. And about eight, nine days later, I rang him again and said, oh, look, is there any news? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you come to a meeting tomorrow night, which is Tuesday? And I said, all right. And he said, look, come to, uh, it was this really dodgy hotel in Niverton Road in, in Bournemouth. <laughs> and it was lashing it down with rain. I went down there and eventually a guy called Roy Pack came out, Australian guy. And he said, I'm here to represent the two remaining directors, a chap called Brian Willis. He's a lovely guy, um, still goes to games. He often sits behind me at the games. And a chap called Norman Hayward, who used to be chairman. And they owed, well, the club owed a lot of money to the bank. Um, and I said, well, look, we work with the bank. Maybe I can help. And they came in the next day to see me in my law firm in London. We spoke to the bank. The bank wasn't interested unless they put up more money. And then two days later, the bank shut the club on a Friday morning. Well, all fairly dramatic then. I mean, who do you think was responsible that it that it ended up in such a parlous state at that time? Oh, I don't know. It's really hard. I mean, I don't think anybody ever intends to take over a football club and then find they haven't got the money. I think that um, too many circumstances came together at that time. 
club was very reliant on selling players. Norman Hayward had done a very good job, actually, in prior years of doing that, developing talent, selling them on. And the club had just reached its ultimate negative position. You know, many teams, particularly lower league teams, still rely on people to put money in. And all the directors, a guy called Colin Legg, who used to own the uh, golf course over at Dusbury, he'd put a stack of money in. Um, Jeffrey Haywood, absolutely wonderful man, had put a stack of money in. And they'd hit the, hit the buffers. And they were borrowing money at exorbitant rates from places in outfits in Monaco. And the bank had had enough. So it shut the door. And I'd gone to work that Friday, got home that Friday night. There was a message on my answer phone. No such things as mobiles then. Um <laughs> And it was from this Australian guy, Royston Pack, saying the club's been shut. Will you come to a meeting next morning? I could have said yes. I could have said no. I said I'd go. Went to a meeting with him, Arthur Anderson, who were appointed as receivers. Uh, Brian was there, Brian Willis, Norman. And they were all arguing because basically the league had said put some money up or you're going to be shut down completely. You're not going to play any more games. The team were playing away at Bristol City that afternoon which they won one nil. the yeah. Ian Cox scored. And um, ultimately, they looked at me and they said, well, you said you wanted to help. <laughs> you, you, ra- you raised the money. <laughs> I was like, yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, Six, wanted 650000 in the league within wow. five days to show that we could survive the season. You know, bearing in mind that was probably oh, more than 30% of the club's annual turnover. So, I mean, at that point, were you... Were you provided access to look at their finances and you know check the no. pretty forensically? I mean, but no. surely with that figure in mind, you know, given the attendances at the time, you must have been, been thinking, okay, this is going to be a struggle. No, I didn't actually. The weird thing was, I kind of turned up. I think I'd cycled up there uh, on the Saturday morning, so I was playing football that afternoon, and I kind of listened. And the guys from Arthur Anderson were saying, well, we're not putting money in. The bank's not putting money in. The director said, well, we're not putting any money in. And they said, well, you, you know, you do it. You said you wanted it out. And I just, by luck, when I'd have my year out from school and university, because I decided I wanted to do law, not English, so I had to stay out for a year and try to go to, to Oxford, I'd ended up working for the BBC voluntarily um, with a guy called Richard Williams, because his, te- his teacher at Porchester School had um, said, let's put a programme on four or five nights a week with a guy called Nick Girdler um, oh, yeah. to, do, to do something else. It was what it was called. And I'd gone on there and I was the person who went out and interviewed people to uh, do bits and pieces for the programme. So pop stars and celebrities that came into the area. And by this time, 12 years on, Richard was the sports editor for Radio Solon. So I rang him. He said, well, come on the show. You know, you know what you to do. Go to the studio at the BIC. I'll interview you. So I got this interview where he was going, this is Trevor Watkins. He knows what's going on at Bournemouth. Trevor, what do we need to do? Oh, we need to raise all this money. Mm. And people started ringing him. And so, I mean, was it at that point that you thought that you need to, because obviously you could have gone to, you know, maybe some investors or whatever, but your thought was to, you know, let's try to involve the community somehow. Oh, I didn't know anything about it at that stage. I mean, at the end of the day, I was a lawyer working in London who just so happened to follow AFC Bournemouth. I was a, a litigation lawyer, nothing to do with football, nothing to do with corporate rescues, nothing to do with finance. It just seemed like, uh, uh, you know, this is my club. This is the team I'd watched all my life. Um, and I offered to help. And then things began to develop. Um, the Australian guy that the two directors had brought in, he was quite clearly wanting to control the process. It was really a war between them and the bank, um, a war that went on for many, many years. And I didn't know that at the time, really. I mean, I'd got some inkling of it. But the next day, this Australian guy called me in to his hotel uh, in Niverton Road, made very clear he was going to be in control, but wanted there to be a public me- uh, not p- uh, meeting at the club on the Sunday night, which I went to. And Mel Machen came and Matty Holland. Um, uh, and a number of the councillors, a number of supporters. And that was probably the pivotal moment because one of the councillors said, well, why don't you have a public meeting Tuesday night? And I said, well, I'm very happy to do that, but I need some help. 
and four or five supporters, a chap called Ken Dando, a guy called Andrew Kay, um, and many others volunteered. Um, they, Andy Noonan, uh, they would all become pivotal in the future of the club. And at that point, I cottoned on that there was going to be more of a fight between the directors and the bank. And I said, fine, well, I'm prepared to do this if it's a public thing. It's independent. It's for the supporters. It's for the town. It's for the community. That's when it really started. And I remember Terry Lovell at the club was great. He got a press release out for us on Monday. The council said use the Winter Gardens. Sadly, no longer any, where is it, anymore. Yeah, Tuesday right. night. I took the day off work. We had, we had a meeting that Monday night of six of us, Andrew Kay, Ken Dando, Andy Noon and others all of whom, or those who are still with us, still watch the club. And um, I think from that moment on, every night for five, six months, we met. We did our work. We got together at six o'clock. We finished at midnight, sometimes one in the morning. I would invariably go to bed, get up and go to London the next day and then come back because I was way too junior in my law firm at that point to be able to work from home. Um, how times change. Um, <laughs> no, no COVID-19 yeah. then. Um and we just thought we did. And it was a wing and a prayer, literally. And we got caught up in a real skirmish, a bum fight between the directors and the bank. We got caught up in huge amounts of uh, disagreements between different people that wanted different things to the club. But we just grew and grew. And, you know, uh, within, a, within a matter of days, decided maybe it was worth trying to save it and buy it for the fans, which is what happened in the end. That was fantastic. I mean, at what point did they actually give up and, and decide they weren't going to fight you? They didn't. It went on for years. We were threatened for years and years and years after the takeover. Um, and as many different, um, everybody's entitled to a different opinion, obviously, in terms of how they interpret things. What really surprised me was the, um, you know, the, the way in which that played out. Um, we we were only ever trying to save the club, but we were we were we were on the receiving end of quite a number of threats for quite some time about being caught up in litigation, threatened personally because we tried to save or we had saved the club. Um, some people believed it shouldn't have gone that way; it should have gone another way. And um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think the supporters as a group got 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 in the way to a degree, and it and it was tough to be honest. It was, you know, there were some very very good people. People like Brian Willis, um, people like Jeffrey Hayward, Peter Hayward, people like Peter Aldersley, who still go every week. John still goes every week. Uh, John Saunders, who still goes every week. Uh, Andrew Kay, who goes whenever he can. Um, all these people, um, Peter Phillips, who became chairman later on, um, they all played their part <coughs> in keeping the club alive. So... There were thousands that turned out at the Winter Gardens. Did you expect that kind of turnout? No, not in a million years. It was it was unbelievable. And I think we raised about £35,000 that night. I mean, what did you do with the money that night? Put it in buckets and, and took, it, <laughs> took, it out to, took it out to the New Forest and hid it. Um, really? really? Our, tactical, our tactical planning, a bit like the government these days. You never wow. quite know exactly how to deal with all the circumstances. And to be fair, we didn't, we, there's a lot of things we didn't get right. We, we were making up as we went along. Um, and that was one of them. Crikey, it's 11 o'clock at night. We've got bucket loads of cash. Where do we do? What do we do with it? So a couple of the guys slept out in the new forest um, looking after the money. You know, it's, it was hand to mouth. But, you know, the next morning, Jeffrey Hayward rang and said, I'll give you £100,000. Wow. Whoa. You know, Harry Redknapp rang up. You know, he, um, he eventually lent us some money in the end. Mm. Um, but a lot of people put a lot of faith in that supporter group. I mean, many people probably remember Ken Dando. Yes. Sadly died a few years after the rescue happened. Um, and, you know, there's a terrific picture of him, Andrew Kay, Steve Fletcher, Eddie Howe, myself, on the south end shaking a bottle of champagne because that's what the daily echo said yeah. to do um and it's a brilliant picture of us i mean that just goes down in memory and i think that and the the huge ask of the town and, and what everybody did 
um you know i don't think any of us probably realized how open we'd suddenly be to scrutiny and criticism and hassle and so on but nobody ever backed away and these people everybody did it for nothing and i think that's incredible and the fact they will still go and watch the club and you know different chairmen subsequently have had their views had their disagreements over supporters rescuing the club uh, and ultimately have we not done it the club will probably have survived in some shape or form one way or another um but you know we i i, I firmly believe we did our best it was 23 years ago and um we we worked incredibly hard and we had some great support from across the fan base i think it's always interesting when it comes to takeovers because fans expect people to put their money into very deep pockets to bail out clubs and i don't think there's necessarily a great understanding of what is actually involved in doing that you know the cost not just financially but personally as well for for people like you to do that to do what you did yeah i mean it didn't cost me directly in finance i never had the money to put money up front it cost me in other ways and it cost a lot of people a lot of money um the likes of your peter orders it is your andrew dawson who came in as ceo people who really cared passionately and i think particularly at lower level if you're going to be involved in, in running a club you take keith McAllister, who i have the privilege of sitting i sit next to the vicar the current club secretary and keith with my season ticket now keith has been involved in the club since 1969 mm. and when he opened the supporters uh, shed as it was at that time and keith became club secretary and was a yeah. star the likes of liz finney who st still work at the club who with Andrew Dawson be washing out the toilets at midnight on a Saturday night. That's what you don't see. Yeah. And it's really, you know, the, the sheer dedication of people is, is absolutely incredible. And I, I remember the funniest thing was looking back is this guy, Roy Pack, who himself himself was a hired gun being paid by the directors. He, he did a good job. He got them off their personal guarantees. Um, but he said, oh, that Watkins, he's just in it for himself. He's in it to make a name for himself. And that was funny because that's just furthest thing from the truth. But I, the, the irony is here I am 23 years on doing nothing other than advising in sport and entertainment with some of the biggest events and clubs and so on. Um, and still sitting and watching Bournemouth whenever I can. And still got my season ticket. My dad's no longer with us. He died actually 10 years ago, near enough. Um and I miss that because that used to be my time with him. But now with daughters and being able to take them and it's hard to get tickets, very hard to get tickets. Um, I, they can go to more away games because the clubs we work with and they can for me trying to buy a ticket at Bournemouth. But they sometimes come to cup games and they love it. And mm -hmm. having a six and eight year old that love doing that is fantastic. So it's just so, like I do with my dad. Yeah. So as chairman, um, what sort of. How much input were you having in the day-to-day sort of -day running of the club? Because um, obviously, you know, at the time, weren't you juggling work and also being chairman? But, you know, it got so intense at AFC Bournemouth that, you know, you as good as um, sacrificed your, well, your personal and some of your professional relationships. Oh, I was effectively sacked, I think, looking back on it. It was one of those discussions of, I remember we we got to Wembley, as you, we talked about, and... Um, my boss at this big city law firm was very understanding and he did come back and say after about a year of this look i think either you can be chairman of the club or partner in this law firm which is fair in actual fact but then he said you know either choose one or the other and if i were you i'd choose being being chairman of the club because you'll make something of it you will have a career in sport now i didn't see that at the time and i came to work in bournemouth which was a disastrous mistake um well-meaning firm but it really didn't work for me working outside of london and i ended up going to work for a small firm in southampton and wondering where it would where it would all lead and whether i should just give up on being a lawyer um never wanted to take a penny out of the club never took a penny out of the club as chairman i didn't believe i didn't think that was right so we had a full-time chief exec come in but obviously everybody on the board the andy noonans the andrew Kays, the ken dandos etc peter aldersley 
um, were giving their time for nothing unless it became their job as it did for Peter for a time. And yeah, it was, it's hard because sometimes I find it very difficult to see, see where it was all going to lead and to say, um, it is, there it is, there is an irony now that, um, here I sit here and I'm very lucky to work with the likes of Liverpool, Southampton, other teams and around across Europe and on not just football, but you know, Olympic games and horse racing and various other bits and pieces. And there was a lot of talk about Mel Bush at the time, who was, uh, for those listening who don't go back that far, was a bit of a pop promoter of his day uh, and another consortium. Why do you think Lloyds Bank backed you and the, the community club idea? It's a good question, because of course Mel and I, we spoke, we offered to fall in behind him, but it wasn't right for him at the time. Um, and of course, the irony is that we signed Jason Tyndall, who then married his daughter. Um, and <laughs> that, um, it's funny how things come around. Isn't it just? Because Jason went to manage Weymouth, if you remember, years yeah, and years right. ago. And I think that I have a lot more appreciation for why Mel would not have wanted to have us fall in behind at the time. Hugely successful in music world and entertainment and very used to running his own business. Um, the other bit, of course, was from uh, Norman Hayward. Uh, he would have come back in. But again, he put himself behind the supporters, which is full credit to him for doing so. And the bank, I, I don't know. I remember it was Colin... Colin Grant is his name, he's the bank manager. I remember we were up in London, um, Ken Dando and I, and we were negotiating with the bank. And they just said, look, we're not going to let the club go for anything less than the land value. And I know we've been criticised for doing that deal and on those terms. But they basically said, why, why should we? we? We've done the hard part. We put it into receivership. We could build houses. We'll get our money back in full. But we are prepared to do a deal. And it is frustrating, and I, I do appreciate that a number of people wouldn't understand necessarily the legal implications. There's always a difference between if you've got your money secured on land and if you're unsecured. So we had two issues. We had to deal with Lloyds because they could build houses on the land and pay them what the land was worth effectively or what they were owed. And we had to deal with the unsecured creditors, which was a football league requirement, which is why we ended up doing the deal that we did, which I still was, I'm adamant, was a very good deal. But why did the bank back us? Well, this guy said to me in the meeting, we're not going to alter our price, but we believe you're the people that will repay us in full. Now, eventually we did. But of course, football moved on. And five years after the supporter rescue, wages were shooting up. The ground needed rebuilding. Um, we hadn't found anybody with tens of millions of pounds who wanted to back the club in 97. And it was a very hard ask in 2001, 2002. And a bit like the situation we're in now as a, in this country and worldwide with this epidemic, you have to make your decisions based on the right views at the right time and by consensus. And that doesn't mean you get it right in everybody's mind. And we didn't. Um, and eventually, of course, uh, when Tony Swaysland came in as chairman, he replaced me um, and other chairman followed. And then Peter Phillips was left to pick up the pieces, so to speak, and made the decision to sell the stadium. Now, again, he's been criticised for that, but he has made that decision having explored all the options. It's not easy. And full credit to every chairman there's been. They make decisions in the public eye. Yeah, so one of the ways that obviously we could make money was through player sales. And of course, we yep. know that Matt Holland went, Jamie Vincent, um, Ian Cox as well. Although Ian Cox, there was a, yeah. I read something about you debating a one and a half million pound deal for him. Is that right? No, I apologised to Ian a few weeks back, actually, um, oh. about that. Because he's back on the um, the community, That's correct, uh, yeah. the, the, the club. And um, I said, you know, it was four or five o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon when um, Fulham rang. And Kevin Keegan was the manager and he wanted to sign him. And we were playing away at Chesterfield that night. Now, 
Mel Machin, those of you who know Mel, Mel's quite stroppy in a very good way. <laughs> yeah. I, I, he, he's brilliant. I mean, I know we had the nine faces of Mel that all look the same, but he, 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 <laughs> He was brilliant. He gave us the time of day. He would always explain his decisions. And we, we were playing Chesterfield, and I didn't think it was probably the best time to ring him and tell him to drop Ian Cox. I think probably I wasn't confident enough mm. to do that. I probably should have done for many reasons, for the club, for Ian particularly. Um, but he's on, on his own admission, he had a nightmare that night. Mm. And Fulham withdrew their interest the next morning. Now... Maybe that means their interest wasn't going to be as strong as it, yeah. it but you know, with hindsight, it is a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, one and a half million would have gone That'd a long, old. long, long, long way. Well, it, it would have gone a long way. And when you look at some of the central defenders that we had at the time, like Eddie Howe, um, and then of course, a certain Frenchman, Mr. Frank Rolling, who was oh, instrumental yeah. in our Wembley run, I still feel gutted and disappointed for him to this very day that he didn't get any minutes at Wembley but Wembley I mean that was another financial boost for the club but just tell us your memories um obviously let's start from the semi-finals because we won 2-0 at Walsall and what a a perfect evening beautiful I mean every fan says well you know your club never makes it easy but I mean come on we've we've gone up and won 2-0 I'm thinking Mm. wow this is good Uh, this is (laughs) but it 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 didn't go quite according to plan at home. But it was Frank Rolling that that popped up with the winner. Well, it wasn't even the winner because we lost but, 3-2, didn't we? Yeah, if it, he, you remember, it was, um, didn't they go 3-1 up? Yeah, they did, yeah. And it was looking like looking very dodgy. Um, but I just remember Frank steaming up from the back. Mm. People were never quite sure. And he did, it wasn't a header. He, volley, he, he kicked it in. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, what, what's he doing? Why is he running up the pitch? <laughs> um and of course, the, the Michael, the vicar we at the time, who was sadly very ill. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just remember him saying, oh, we, we got covered in champagne and by the players and everything. And it was, it was just the most momentous occasion. I mean, who can forget John Bailey kind of stripped mm-hmm. down to his shorts, selling shirts to the supporters mm-hmm. in the club shop while we were waiting to actually get on a coach to go up to Wembley. Yeah. It was just brilliant. crazy times. Um, then he went and scored as well. So he went and scored. He did. He not much and then through. It was just so annoying that we lose losing the circumstances we did. Yeah. Um, but you know, sixty three and a half thousand. What a party! That was um, great. Yeah. Yeah, we've had some great evenings in our time, and you know, the rescue, the second rescue that Jeff Mostyn led. It was very different. Um, no less serious, but a very different feel, a very different um, situation in that we we had got somebody who could write the check and did so. And I think, you know, we should we are all incredibly grateful to Jeff. I've got to know Jeff very well indeed. And that's one of the lovely things for me is that as, a, as an ex-chairman, you know, sometimes you don't want an ex-chairman kind of rolling around the place, but he's got quite a few of them um, mm. <laughs> sitting around. And he he and I have had the pleasure of many chats and many adventures, in actual fact. And he still won't forgive me for a few of those, but um, we, 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 in, the, in the nicest sense, because he, he's, he's a tremendous gentleman. Um, and it's always an absolute pleasure when we sit and talk um which we do quite often actual fact which is nice and you know when you look at it one of the interesting things is how what the fans did 23 years ago and what jeff did how it all has kind of come together because your management team at the club eddie richard hughes steve fletcher and so on they all got their place at the club in that era of 97 onwards they all came together jason tindall was signed um of the richard hughes was signed and it's nice to see that now because they're the team that have delivered the premier league to the club Mm. and jeff 
if the fans hadn't done what they did, and Jeff hadn't done what he did, we wouldn't be here. Neither would the people who pulled it all together in the late 90s, early 2000s, who are now doing that now in the Premier League. I think you're right there, Trevor. I think a lot of the DNA of the club about its community feel, the community spirit, it, it's, it's really deep within the club still you know not just through the fans which you kind of expect a lot of fans feel very intimately connected to the club but it is the playing staff the coaching staff the management all the people who work there it's very strong yeah and it's i remember it you know, it was um when the time came for me not to be chairman anymore that was very much down to another to tony swaysland wanting to put money into the club and if he was going to put money into the club quite fairly wanting to be the chairman um, and that goes with the territory and I think that my you know I, to be honest it was a good time for me to stand down as well but I wondered then I wondered well what where is it going to go what's going to happen what and it did take some years to get back to begin to get back to normal to actually enjoy watching the games again because it's a hell of a job when you're a director worrying about the win the lose the draw I mean you can imagine at the moment goodness knows where this season ends up um this whole pandemic could be a blessing in disguise if if we do play again because most of our teams should be fit hopefully yeah, that's right um you know, what what for a david brooks playing a game um, yeah. which he <laughs> may right. may not have done um before but generally that dna that feel is there it's 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 um it's around the ground it's um it's in who you sit with the faces you see and that's been the same all the way through yeah, so it was 2001 that you stepped down, I think. I, yeah. Now, I listened to an interview with uh, that you did with Michael Dunn from the All Departments podcast. This was about five or six years ago. Yeah. And under your chairmanship, one of the things you said in the interview that um, pricked my ears up a little bit was you occasionally saw glimpses of the things that weren't right from the previous regime. Um, can you expand on what you meant by that? Well, I think it's just been well documented. You know, Ken Gardner fell out with a number of the other directors. Um, and generally speaking, it's, you know, it, it's so long ago now. It, you, you just could see that a lot of the problems had come from some of the ways of management. And I said, no, we don't, we didn't, we didn't get that right. And I've got, you've got the likes of say Brian Willis and Norman Hayward who stayed there and looked to try and put things right. Um, but it was obviously a very divided board at the time. One of the things you got um, right, as I said earlier, with the, the player sales when we needed it to help pay wages. One of the ones maybe that you and the management maybe got wrong, but this was a very unfortunate was the signing of Roger Bolly. What yeah. happened there? <laughs> mm-hmm. do, you remember we had, do you remember we had Mark Steen? Oh, yeah. He was great. Mark Steen was a he terrific was signing. He was a yeah, free trying, transfer. Was, yeah, I was, was trying to deflect attention to one of our better signings. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, no, I'm claiming no credit for any signings apart from one. It wasn't Roger. Um, Roger had had a terrific season. He had, yeah. He's got 33 goals or something like that your previous year. He was available for about 150,000 and we had money. And Mel said, uh, you know, let's look at the strikers. Let's look who we can bring in. And he came in. Now, our medical, may, you know, nowadays, the medicals they go through would be far more stringent. But what, what we didn't know then and we found out was his legs had gone. He I mean, didn't have heart, some acceleration. Your heart must have sank when you saw him, you know, going off the pitch in tears. And you just, he must be thinking, you know, that was six figures gone yeah it is because it was particularly when you don't got any money mm. um there again the reason we signed Jermaine Defoe and it, this is true was I we, we'd lost the day before might have been in Colchester I can't remember where we lost to but I'd gone into the ground on the Sunday the manager and I was going Look, you need to score goals it's clear from I could say things to him. I said you need to sign a striker well, I haven't got any who are we going to sign I can't get anybody and I was writing a column for 442, and on the back cover, opposite my column, it said, one to watch, Jermaine Defoe. I said, well, this bloke's played for West Ham. Apparently, he could score goals. You should ring Harry. Well, I don't know if he'd be good enough, said Mel. So he rang Harry going, you got a player, Jermaine Defoe. He said, yeah. He said, uh, can I have him on trial for a day? 
I don't know if he'll be good enough. He'll be fine for you. So that's my only claim to fame. Yeah. And I, well, I, I say it tongue in cheek. That's it's pretty really impressive. Mate. That is pretty impressive. That is a claim to fame. Yeah, no, it really but, is. Now, before I um, hand over to Jeff again, now, obviously, after Wembley, between sort of Wembley and 2001, obviously, this new whole stadium thing uh, yeah. you know, came about. And obviously, there were organisations such as AFC BISA, um, the KDSA, after Ken Dander, of course, the Community Mutual. And these organisations all came together to raise money to help you know, pay for the new stadium. But obviously, we needed a lot more money than that to actually build the stadium. How was it funded? Uh, I think um, by hook and by crook and by trying to persuade people. I mean, we had two things that happened that were good for us. At least on paper, they looked good. One was when the football, the football foundation agreed to give us far more money than we might otherwise have been entitled to. Um, that was fairly and squarely down to the fact that we lent them two players uh, to play in a match against the FA, which they wanted to win on a Friday <laughs> night before we were playing Ox- Oxford United away. Um I remember saying to Mel, I need two players. Um, one of them was Danny Smith. And it was, uh, it was funny. Guy, Come on, guys, you're going with the chairman to Ealing to play on a 3G pitch because it might get us a few more million quid, which it did do. Um, and I, this, is, this is slightly more past my time, really, in the sense of it got taken over by others who were doing the negotiations. But a gentleman called Stanley Cohen, who liked football, who lived over in Camford Cliffs, wanted to get involved in what started as he'd make a loan, ended up with him putting a fairly a small loan, fairly subsizable amount of money towards getting the stadium built. Um, and of course, then we got naming rights and so on. And obviously, the uh, situation with Stanley went on for quite some time and he ended, he ended up being owed quite a lot of money. Um, and that, that was one of the things that had to be resolved in future years, as I recall. I was going to ask just what what do you think of the club's current situation with the uh, with the stadium? I mean, there's lots of talk about what's going to happen. What do you think is going to happen? But who would go and spend 60, 70, 80 million quid on a new stadium? Where's where's you know that money's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. Um, and while you're in the Premier League, um, spending that sort of money on infrastructure is a good long term investment, but you know, frankly, it's a huge amount of money to find. Huge amount of money to find. Um, there are lots of projects going on. A lot of clubs are doing it. And I think that Bournemouth would benefit significantly by having new facilities. But I think concentrating on the training ground is a very good thing to do, first of all. Um, and, you know, the, the infrastructure is, is creaking. But again, in the sense that if you compare it to other Premier League grounds, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a huge amount of money to find. And I think it's a big, big ask to go out there and build a new stadium. Yeah, agreed. So uh, you said in an interview in The Independent back in 1997, you said, you know, when you support a team like Bournemouth, that you're going to get something to cheer about every 10 years or so, which keeps yes. you going. So yes, I'm indeed. just thinking I'm just thinking about it. In 98, it was Wembley. In 2008, it was minus 17. And then less than a decade later we go and reach the Premier League. Now, I do think you're, I mean, incredible optimism, Trevor, but surely not even you would have expected that we could have actually done that. No, not at all. And I remember, um, it was actually Eddie Mitchell asked me, Eddie Mitchell actually asked me to go to a meeting with Neil Blake and Max Demim uh, on Sandbanks um, quite some time before this happened and not long after Max had got involved in the club. And, what came across from all of them was a very strong positivity that they really wanted to achieve something. And again, they, a different dynamic, but Max along with Jeff Mostyn have really backed the club and taken it forward. And no, not never in a million years would I have imagined that we would on a wing and a prayer have got to the Premier League. Um, and here we are five seasons in. I mean, what must that be like, the difference? Uh, compare the meeting that you had then that you were invited to compared to the first time you walked into the club. Um, the first time is ultimate negativity. And then you're with a group of guys who are thinking, you know, let's talk about the P word. We think we can reach the top flight. Yeah, and I, I firmly believe, and I do a lot of work now on buying and selling teams across Europe. And my emphasis is always on, can you get the right team of people in to run the club? Because... 
ultimately, I've got a very good friend now who's director of football for Red Bull globally, and he looks after all their teams. And we spend a lot of time talking about strategy and how clubs evolve and how they develop and how you make them sustainable for the long term. And I think having people who can have an eye for talent and development and bringing on younger players is critical for the success in the future. Mm. So, yeah, it's it's incredible. And um, it is easy to become somewhat blasé about it all. Um, and we should never do that. What do you think, Trevor, about the current situation? Obviously, we're in the relegation zone. Um, do you think relegation... Cancel the league. Cancel the league. <laughs> but, but if we did get relegated, do you think that would be catastrophic for the club? Not um, not immediately. Not immediately. Um, I think the management. I would. I'd like to think Eddie Howe would stick with the club. Um, again, I've had the pleasure of knowing him many many years, and we don't speak as often as we used to because uh, back in '97 in the nineties, but still stay in touch. And it's lovely to see. Really lovely to see what they've done. I think that. I think frankly, you know, everybody's been on a very long journey here. And although there are many bad things coming out of this situation and some terrible things with a number of people dying and being ill and so on, and there are positives, sense of community, sense of togetherness, sense of being, which actually reflects AFC Bournemouth. And it was lovely reading an interview with Eddie, Eddie saying that he's got to spend time at home with his family and his children who see him. I, 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 I would warrant that at this stage, this this type of situation, not that anybody have wanted it, um, may well benefit Bournemouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it refreshes, replenishes. He's a great st- strategist. Yeah. Um, he'll get the best out of his team if they get to play those games. Um, I don't think, I think as a lawyer, it would be hugely challenging for the Premier League to decide to finish the league now yeah. um, or come up with some system they be held to pay one way or the other. There's too much at stake, um, too much money at stake. And uh, much as Leeds fans and West Brom fans may well hate me for saying so, I think the league should should cancel this season and move on to the next. Well, there'll be legal consequences should, the, uh, should they pe- play even behind closed doors and then one of the players on the pitch contracts it, etc., or something happens, then it, it just seems to be nonsensical to me. Um, but... You know, who knows how it's going to play out? Well, it's, it's one of the areas where I would definitely be offering free legal advice. Um, <laughs> because all these years on, we've actually, you know, I've got a team of lawyers who work on these particular issues. Um, and we've, we've run arguments on these particular situations before. And I think that the, the worst thing the Premier League could do would be to end the season and now and say the standings are as they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it'd be also, a lot of legal change. Also, sorry. Also, the uh, the Dutch and the Belgians and the French are now all avoiding their leagues. And the uh, head of uh, FIFA's medical team saying yesterday that we should just forget about this season and start next next season. I think the pressure seems to be building. Yeah, and I, obviously I'm privy through the clubs we work with to a number of the discussions that are ongoing. So I'm just giving my personal opinion rather than the advice we're giving to any clubs um, that we work with. But I, I, I agree. I think that the the example that a number of leagues are coming out with, uh, I mean, the French league haven't resolved what they're going to do about the top league. Um, the Dutch have just left it intact and the teams aren't being promoted or relegated. I do think uh, people would say, well, you would say that as a Bournemouth fan. That's the the, 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 um, the best way to be. When you said earlier something I picked up on about um, having the right blend of staff at AFC Bournemouth, um, and we seem to have a good spine right down through to you know the management. Um, that's all very well and good, but we wouldn't have get you know, got to the Premier League without money and spending more than we should. So when people talk about the fairy tale, people also mention financial fair play. Um, what's your view on that? Because you know. As much as AFC Bournemouth are the blueprint for teams that want to get promoted, in some ways you could argue that we did it in a way that was unethical. Um, as have other teams. Um, other teams have breached the rules. The rules are there. The rules set out what happens if you breach them. Um, I mean, to be honest, 
when I look at that, I think that it's it's you know you, you, it's a bit like George Orwell, Animal Farm. All pigs are equal, but some pigs are more equal than others. I think that. It, it, Every club will look at how it runs its business, how it runs its finances, and make the right strategic decisions. Bournemouth have made the, their decisions. It's decisions that have got Bournemouth into the Premier League. It's brought a lot of joy to our town. And from my perspective, without knowing all the ins and outs, um, there, you know, that a process has been followed and a decision reached through applying the rules. Um, Bournemouth are in the Premier League. They've been penalised. Um, you know, perhaps we shouldn't have got minus 17 points all those years ago. Mm. And perhaps we should have fallen into administration. Um, maybe Roger, Roger Bolly's legs might have worked better. There's lots of things that um, <laughs> you never know. could have happened, but didn't. Um, and the club's fought and overcome. So maybe sometimes we deserve a bit of luck, a bit of the rub of the green. And that's got us into the Premier League. And, you know, that is very much down to Max Demin. Yeah. So what's next for you then, Trevor? Are you going to be uh, head of legal advice at FIFA or something like that coming up soon? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I've, I've been offered a number of roles at different clubs um, yeah, and, and things outside of football, but particularly within football. And I think that, you know, my, my pleasure is really, a lot of the factors that comes into my mind is, can I still watch Bournemouth play? Um, <laughs> we <Good> were... <laughs> We were, we were, I'll tell you a funny story. We were doing a deal to buy Everton. And Everton were playing down at Bournemouth. And you remember the game? We're 2 0 down, aren't we? Oh, With yes, of course. Eight mm-hmm. minutes to go, something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting with the Everton directors. And um, one of my clients. And of course, I know where the deal's at. They know where the deal's at. And I'm sitting there, I've got 2 0. It goes back to 2 all. I've controlled my excitement at this point. And being very diplomatic. Of course, then Everton goes 3-2 up. And you remember it was like six minutes injury time? Yeah. Um, when they, they scored. <clears throat> and they celebrated too long. Ball goes back to the centre. Uh, ball goes down the own. Score, 3 all. I launched myself into the air. <laughs> I have never been left to forget that by my clients. Who continually remind me that my impartiality... And, and ability to control emotions is fundamental to not giving the game away. And they just, I just get teased remorselessly about that. So, yeah, it's brilliant to be a Bournemouth fan working within sport, to be honest. Oh, good stuff. And it's, yeah, well, it's nice to um, talk to you. And it seems that um, a lot of members of staff, whether it's, um, you know, today or yesterday, they're all fans as well, which uh, all sort of brings us together and makes it that much more close-knit feel. There's a huge amount of people that pull in all one direction every day of the week to keep that club afloat and heading in the right direction. And what I learned is, you know, I, I used to have all, I, all my opinions about who should play left back, right back, all that sort of stuff. And I still do. But what I did learn is that it's a really hard job being a chairman, being a director, being involved in the running of that club. Um, and no one I've seen in all the years has ever made a decision other than the one they believe was right. And I think, I think you can ask more than that. Yeah, good stuff. Well, Trevor, it's been uh, fantastic to have you on today. Thank you so much for joining Absolute us. Absolute pleasure. And Jeff, once again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, great to talk to you, Trevor. For, for me, you've always been the, the sort of hero who saved the club back in those days. So thanks again for what you did. Really appreciate no, it. No, I think it's... Um, as I've always said, it's just incredible how many people pull together. And that's why it's such fun to do this. You know, here we are, say, all these years on. And hopefully, hopefully, football to look forward to in the not-too-distant future once it's all cleared up. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Now, do uh, stay tuned to the Back of the Net YouTube channel because on Sunday we are pleased and privileged to be joined by Mark Pugh, who scored that magical goal against Bolton Wanderers, was with us for nine seasons, and I'm sure we'll have a story or two from him and also some real big names in the next couple of weeks as well. So do remember to subscribe and we'll see you in the next video of the Cherries. Let's go! 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 Let's